It's Wednesday night, and we are in a study. Oh, goodness, I don't even know how to express it. Uh, on the Old Testament. But we have, once in a while I go off, I don't like to call it a rabbit trail. It is like a pinwheel. Or it's like, I wouldn't call it a maze. I would call it a very intricate uh, network of words and concepts. We started in Genesis and went through Genesis from the beginning. We got up to Adam and Eve and the, we'll call them an A and E, in the second chapter and got into uh, Eve eating of the tree and seducing Adam in the third chapter and then in the fourth chapter, Cain and Abel, and, uh, Cain and Abel and then uh, on up to the flood in the sixth chapter and then, of course, in the fifth chapter, the lineage of God and got up to the flood six through nine, went into Abraham, went to the table of nations, chapter 10, I went into Abraham, went to Babylon being begun in 11. At the end of 11, Abraham comes along and then Isaac and then Jacob. In that uh, 12th chapter, Abraham gets the covenant and then Isaac gets the covenant in tw and Isaac gets the, excuse me, Abraham gets the covenant in 17 and Isaac gets the covenant in 17. Jacob gets the covenant in 28 and then we get to Jacob's sons, 12 sons becoming the nation of Israel when he flees to the land of Haran. And then when he gets there, he has 12 sons, or he has 11 sons there. And then, uh, then he comes back to the land, and then Joseph is sold into bondage in 37 through 50. That's the story of Joseph. Then they come out of Egypt, Exodus, the second chapter. Moses leads them out. He's born there in two. And then in 12, that's the Passover, the first Passover, the last plague in Egypt. They leave Egypt and they go to the, they go to the mountain of God. In that 18, well, they leave Egypt, 14th chapter, they go through the Red Sea. And then they get to the mountain of God in chapter 18, 19. He goes up on the mountain of God, gets the Ten Commandments, comes down with the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. Then God starts giving instructions about how to live their daily life called the law. And they get to the 25th chapter and God's giving instructions on building the temple and all the furniture of the temple. The first thing he tells them to build is the sanctuary, but the first instructions he gives them is the Ark of the Covenant. We worked our way through that, finding that the Ark was the throne of God and it equates to our hearts in the New Testament because our hearts are sprinkled over here. The ark was sprinkled over here. The law is written on tables of stone over here, written on fleshy tables of our heart over here in the New. We got on down in that 25th chapter to the candlesticks. We've kind of got stuck on this. Whenever I'm studying, I don't teach a verse and give you the meaning of it. We hit something like the candlesticks we find out that it kind of networks all through the Bible like this. It's like a network that all hooks together. And before you know it, you've got this. And everything relates to everything else. And this is what we've found out in this network of the candlesticks. And you don't leave the subject, I can take any given subject and start teaching on it and network that subject from one end of the Bible to the other. We found, let me just say some things that the candlesticks are. The candlesticks, this was called menorah. And that candlesticks, when you look at it from the floral pattern, it's a star of David from the top. And a star of David is a hexagon. That's what it is. We've already discovered some things about it. That the star of David is 
six arms coming from the center. Well, that's a bad way to draw it. Let me redraw it. It's actually, when you connect the outside arms, it is a hexagon, or it is Star of David. There's the Star of David there, here, like so. And when you connect the outside lines, it's a hexagon. We've talked about hexagons. We've also said this is the same thing. The Bible says these seven are the eyes of the Lord. They're in the fourth chapter of Zechariah. The Bible also says these seven candlesticks is the seven churches of Asia. Seven meaning the number of refinement. I'm not going to go through that. You can get our previous messages on this and see that. Now, also, this is what the Assyrian war chariot wheels look like. They were six-spoked wheels. The war chariots were six spokes. The peacetime chariots were eight spokes. Now, I'm not going to go fully into this. This is also the human eye. These seven are the eyes of the Lord. The human eye is wheels and wheels. The war chariots were wheels and wheels. You can, uh, we got a picture of them, and they're a wheel and a wheel. And I've said these war chariots of the Babylonians is what refined Israel. And we saw those wheels and wheels in the first chapter of, of Ezekiel. We also see the wheels and the wheels in the 10th chapter of Ezekiel. And wherever you find these seven, wherever you find this iris of the eye, iris, Iris is the Greek word, <coughs> it's a Greek word translated rainbow. And it is a war bow, and the human eye is a wheel and a wheel. It is the outer part of the iris, outer part of the iris is stable. The inner part is a retractable wheel. It's a wheel and a wheel. And then the inner part of the iris, what's inside the iris, is the pupil. God said Israel is the pupil of my eye, and you have, in the human eye, you have what you call cones. And they refine the light that comes through into the eye. Light breaks into seven colors, and the cones are hexagonal shaped prisms lining the retina of the eye, refining. So when you pass light, we are the light of the world, you pass it to a prism, the lenses of your eye are one five thousandth of an inch thick, triangular shaped prisms. Pass light to a prism, it breaks off into seven colors. What refines those colors is the cones and this yellow spot back here, and I'm not going to go through that fully. But we're the pupil of God's eye. The Bible says, Israel is the apple of my eye. That word apple, there in Zechariah, the second chapter, is the word baba. It means pupil. Now, we've learned this and a whole lot more about it. We've learned that the word of God is in the candlesticks. When you look at the candlesticks from the top, what you've got, you've got a light here, light here, 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 here. And Christ is in the midst of of the candlesticks. And what's in the candlesticks, or what if I said what is in the hexagon is the Holy Spirit or the Word of God? Now, I've already said this before. If you want to get the fullness of this message, i got too many places to go tonight. Watch the last six to seven weeks. We went through this, how the human eye was equivalent to, like I said, a rainbow. When you look at it from a mountaintop or an airplane, it is a wheel and a wheel, and there's seven colors in the rainbow. Seven colors. Now, whenever you look at this human eye, 
it has the same type of floral pattern. When you think of the seven colors, inside the wheel and the wheel of the human eye, or inside the iris, you think of the seven candlesticks, or the seven spokes, in the Babylonian war chariots that came in and slaughtered Israel, and they refined Israel. And there's a yellow spot in the middle of that. That's those scythes that, that go out on the side of the wheels. And the Bible says in Nahum, the second chapter, they were ran like the torches. They were like flaming fire. And that color of fire and the color of torches in the Bible is yellow. That's the yellow spot. This is called the yellow spot or the fovea centralis in the eye. And that's equivalent to the seven candlesticks. Inside the candlesticks is the word of the Lord. Inside the chariot wheels, God calls those chariots to come down in the first chapter of Ezekiel. Inside the chariots was the word of the Lord. That was God's word to come and chastise Israel for going after all this idolatry for, for 500 years. And inside God's eye is the judgment of God. And he said, if you touch my church, you've touched the apple of my eye. You've punched me in the eye. And the tears run. The bow bends back. And Christ is coming back with eyes as a flame of fire to take vengeance on all those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. You see his eyes as a flame of fire there in Revelation, the 19th chapter in 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, verse 7 and 8, he's coming back in flaming fire. He's been punched in the eye. There's another thing about these, about these hexagons. We, we talked about this. A hexagon is, is basically a star of David. Every snow flake is a, a six-pointed star or its triangles. All that the Star of David is is two triangles. That's what it is. All snowflakes are formed that way. In the... How can I say all this? The word... There's a word in the Old Testament... Word in the Old Testament. I'm just kind of reviewing this because this is an awful lot. I watched one of the DVDs on TV the other night. I thought, boy, that's complicated. I need to kind of just composite it all together. Uh, there's a word in the Old Testament, Dabar. And God would say, I believe it's in Jeremiah 4, 28, because I have spoken it, I will do it. Spoken is the word Dabar. Dabar is the derivative of the word Deborah. Dabar means commandment or orderly arrangement. And that's a common word used to show the orderly arrangement of God, which is his commandment or his word. And the word Deborah means be, and it comes from the bar. Well, the be is the word, is the word. I've got much to say about bees and honey. Israel is called a land flowing with milk and honey. In the bees create the most unbelievable, it is said, I went on the internet, and they say that the hexagon is the most stable of all geometrical figures. Now, how can that be? I don't really know. We're going to have to talk to somebody that's further educated in geometry than I am. And these bees make up all these. Now, think of bee. Think of word. Because that's what it actually means. Deborah means the word. She was one of the judges of Israel right after Shamgar. And then bees make up this, these most intricate, most intricate network 
of hexagonal figures that they call honeycombs. Inside those honeycombs, they keep, they keep honey and they keep larvae, larvae of those baby bees that are going to grow up to be bees, or what if I said the word? Bees are the word. That's amazing because inside, inside the honeycomb is the word or the bee, isn't it? And inside the candlesticks is the oil. People say, that's freaky. Are you manipulating this? No. Inside the honeycomb is the is the word. Inside the honeycomb is the word, or the bee, or the word. And inside the seven candlesticks is the oil. And the candlesticks is hexagonal shaped prism, or the word. The oil is the Holy Spirit, and that's the word of God, isn't it? Do you think that's accidental? Let me give you something that it's an experiment I did this morning in the kitchen. I've got some fresh honey from that beekeeper over on Dickerson Road. Johnson's. Huh? Johnson's. Yeah, the guy on Dickerson Road, you can buy it in any number of places. I get it up here at Hendersonville Produce. Let me read something to you that they said, and I did it this morning. Yet another spectacular work of the honeybees and the creator of this universal, many have claimed the amazing formation of hexagonal patterns on a film of honey as proof of purity. Too curious to dismiss it, I follow the instructions given. They give you four steps, and I did it this morning in case Mary wondered what that bow was doing out. Put a blob of honey onto a light-colored round plate. Pour in some cold water to cover the honey. Swirl the plate several times. If the honey is pure, you would see a honeycomb image pattern on the honey. And as I swirled it, these hexagons begin to form inside that honey, inside of my dish in the kitchen this morning. I don't know if, it's the, if somehow that God made the viscosity of the honey. Viscosity just means the stickiness, the thing that makes it stick to a solid rather than flow by it. I don't know if he made the viscosity and the water together, but there was just a slight, oh. I didn't get real shocked. Oh. You see, I believe God, God does all these things magnificently. He said if it's pure honey, it's supposed to form that. Now, I don't know what all the other, other factors would come involved. I thought that was very interesting because I did that. I went, wow. You see, I believe God is this magnificent in his creation. Somehow, maybe, and I got to think of the water as the picture of the word of life. It's the picture of the Holy Spirit putting it into the hexagons. We also find that our bodies are made up of something called protoplasm. It's also viscous material. Viscous means the stickiness. This stuff that we're made of is mostly water. The sticky part you would call viscu viscuosity or stick. We can say sticky, okay? Sticky. This sticky stuff we're made of is full of it's uh, full of, it's made up of a honeycombed reticulum. And in each one of these cells that we have, each cell that reproduces other cells, it's made up of this honeycomb reticulum, and every cell has instruction in it or has word in it. 
Every cell has more information than 28 or 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I said that one time when I was teaching at the house, and I brought all my Botanicas downstairs, and they're like this many, you know, on a table. And I said, every cell of your body possesses more information and more instruction or more word than all those encyclopedias on that table, every cell. So your cells, which are made up of a honeycomb reticulum, have instruction or the word in them. Do you think this is some kind of accident? You see, I've never met a preacher that believed that God, you could tie chemistry or physics or mathematics with the human body. I did a series on the DNA. I'm not a scholar when it comes to these things, but I do have chemistry books. I even had doctors buy me chemistry books, anatomy books. And it's amazing what you can go in there and find if you want to. I'm amazed at this. I just simply wanted to kind of review that with you. And if you want the rest of this, you'll have to look at the previous weeks. And where else do we have these honeycombs with the instruction throughout our society and throughout our science and throughout our physics? I'm sure it's everywhere. Now, what we're doing, we're studying. The reason we're studying this is because we've been going through these wheels in the wheels in the first chapter of Ezekiel, and I believe they are war chariot wheels coming down into Israel. The Bible says a whirlwind came out of the north. That's what, that's what Ezekiel says in that fourth verse of the first chapter of Ezekiel. I have to show you something about Ezekiel's position and situation. I've been thinking about this. I have an extremely difficult time. Here I am over in the 25th chapter of Exodus, talking about the candlesticks, it took me to wheels and wheels, to war chariots of the uh, Babylonians, to the whirlwinds, which is what the war chariots were called, because they started up a whirlwind as they ran through that desert. They were called whirlwinds. And it's taken us to the human eye. I've done much on this. I did a series years ago called The Eyes of the Lord. This is an Eyes of the Lord series. It's, it's, uh, I went through colors in the previous Eyes of the Lord series. Colors are really a hard thing to get into. I'll give you one thing on colors, though. Noah was in the ark. God said, pitch the ark within and without with pitch. The word pitch, first word pitch is the word kafar. Second word pitch is kofar. First word pitch is a verb. Second word pitch is a noun. First word pitch means to cover. Second word pitch means to stain or to die. Pitch with pitch has the same definition as baptize. Baptizo with bapto. Baptizo means to cover. Bapto means to stain with a dye. The word baptize is not an English word. Baptize is a, is a Greek word. Mr. Girdlestone, one of the great Greek scholars of the last 500 years, says to us in his synonyms of the Old Testament, he says there was no word that they could translate baptizo and babto in the English language. He said it had a dual meaning. It meant to cover. It meant to stain and to die. He said these two words together were a combination of words that were used by women to stain and dye clothes in the first century. He said it was impossible to translate these words to English. So what they did, they picked up this word babto, changed the, the vowel on the end of it to an E, picked it up, moved it over to the English language, <coughs> put it in an English Bible, 
called it an English word. They anglicized it. C-I-S-E-D. They anglicized the word. Anglicized means to make into English. They just made it an English word. If it had meant to immerse, any translator would have written immerse. It did not mean that. Mr. Girdlestone says it had such a, an ambiguous meaning, had two definitions to it. They just turned it into an English word. True baptism is blood, not water. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. Here's the shadow over here to cover with a stain or dye. That stain, when they would caulk, when you caulk something, Phil caulks things all the time. He does all kinds of handiwork. He takes a caulking gun and caulks something. Why do you do that? To keep water from going in and out, don't you? That's what the caulking was for. It was something called bitumen. It was another name, chemer. But the bitumen was the common term. And they said that was a stain. They put it in boats. It was a caulking. And it was red in color. And the ark was pitched within and without with pitch. It was a red caulking. When the Bible says as eight souls were saved through water, it doesn't say by water over there in 1 Peter, the third chapter, verse 21. It says as eight souls were saved through. The word, it says by in the English text, but it says dia, through. The water was not the baptism. The water was the judgment of God. The baptism was the pitch of the ark. Wasn't it? That kept the people safe. They were saved through the judgment of God. Not by the judgment of God. They were saved through it. Baptism doth also now save us. We're pitched within and without with pitch. Pitching within is the filling of the Holy Spirit or filling of the truth. Pitching without is the covering with the truth. Now, that was a red stain is what it was. So, red plus, here's an equation for you. Here's an here's a algebra equation. Red plus, would you call 370 days in an arc, would you call that a fire and a trial? Huh? They were in the ark 370 days. Look over here in Genesis. Look over here. Genesis. I'll go ahead and give this. I'll just work this into this teaching. Genesis, the ninth chapter. Or excuse me, the seventh chapter. Genesis 7. I hadn't given you this in a while. Genesis 7 chapter, the Lord tells Noah, build an ark, pitch the ark within and without with pitch. Then he says, now we know in verse, he brought the fowls and the ark and, the, and all of the animals, and they come into the ark, and the Bible says, verse 4, Yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days. Now, most people think Noah was in the ark 40 days and 40 nights. That's not true. It rained that long. And then down here in verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, he was 600 years old when he went in the ark. In the second month, the 17th day of the month, it's the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up. I've said this so many times. The fountains of the great deep is speaking of the subterranean waters under the earth. The geologists tell us the largest rivers in the world 
larger than the Amazon, certainly larger than the Mississippi, larger than the Nile, are under the earth. We live on this ball that is filled with all kinds of fire inside. That's where the volcanoes are rising up. And we're on these plates. That's what we are. We are such an unstable thing. I don't know how in the world people can not trust God. We're just on plates. You know, all this fire down here. Got these rivers flowing down here. Well, when the Bible says the fountains of the great deep were broken up, that's these rivers. The crust of the earth went pop like that. So water came from the heavens. It came from the deep. As I said, Mo, uh, I got Moses in the ark again. Noah probably took off on a tidal wave about the height of Mount Everest. Whew, we just took off like that. And God kept the ark level because it was a box. It was shaped like a coffin. 300 cubits long, 30 high and 50 wide. This is what the ark looked like right here. It did not look like a ship. It looked like a box, like a coffin, and it had one opening up there, a little window. That was it. And that box, where they take off? They didn't need any bow or stern to cut the water. They weren't going anywhere except where God wanted them to go. The same day were the fountains, Mayana, M-A-Y-A-N-A-H, It is a derivative of the word A-Y-I-N, which is the Hebrew word I. Remember the eye of the Lord? Whew. When the judgment comes, God's eye begins to pour tears. These fountains of the great deep and the fountains from above were like the tears of God when you punch him in the eye because they had persecuted the people of God. So it was the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, 17th day of the month. Now look over here where they come out of the ark. In, uh, well, look over here in, in chapter 7, verse 24. The waters prevailed upon the earth and 150 days. Now that doesn't mean they came out of the ark after 150 days. They're still in the ark. Prevail means they begin to subside after 150 days. They subside and then he land, they land on Mount Ararat there in verse 4 of chapter 8. The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. Now when did they enter the ark? The second month. So when it landed the seventh month, that's five months, isn't it? Huh? Okay, five months into 150 days, that's 30 days to a month, isn't it? That's where the Jews get their 360-day calendar. 30 days to a month, 312 is 360. There's 360 days in the Jewish calendar. They have to manipulate some of their days to make up for what we call leap year. So they manipulate that on their calendars. Now, so they're in the ark up to this point, Five months, aren't they? When you get down here to verse 13, and it came to pass in the 601st year, when did they go into the ark? They went in in the 600th, they went in the 600th year of Noah's life, 17th day of the month, didn't they? And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month. Well, over here, it's the second month, the 17th day of the month. So, when they enter into the ark, it's the second month, 17th day. When they come out, it's the first month, the first day of the month. So, you're going to be right at 370 days in the ark. Can you see that? There are about 370 days. Would you call that living in that box with no ventilation, smelling animal manure, stinking, 
no way to bathe, no way to stop the animals from stinking, all kinds of manure, and living in all that heat, and only any air that God wanted to see come through that little opening in the top of it, would you call that a fiery trial? Fire is always the color of yellow. All through the Bible. When you have fire, red, the pitch, the baptism, plus fire, plus yellow, what do you get? That's an, that's an algebra equation. When you add red and yellow, fire, when you take our blood baptism and you add the fiery trials of life, what color do you get? You get orange. Orange is a Latin word. It comes from the Latin word A-R-U-W-N. That's the Latin word gold. The trying of your faith in the blood baptism is much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. <coughs> Proverbs speaks of apples of gold and pictures of silver. The Bible always talks about <coughs> our faith is like gold tried in a fire. And when you try gold, that's the picture of purity. Of all the metals in metallurgy that you can put into a furnace, and try, you can turn the heat higher and higher and higher with the gold ore. Gold will not scorch or burn. All it does is become so pure that it becomes liquid where that it can be poured into a form, into a mold where it can conform to whatever God wants it to and we are to conform to the likeness of Christ through the fire and the blood baptism. Now that's a little bit on color. We can spend all day long on that. But you see, I believe all the colors have a meaning. In fact, when the Bible says we've been predestined to conform to his image, the word image is the word icon. It means likeness. You find Christ's likeness in the form of colors in Revelation, the first chapter, Revelation, the tenth chapter, Daniel, the tenth chapter. He's represented in colors. And when you look into, when the eye, the human eye, forms an image, I keep saying you do not see shapes. You see a refraction of colors. That's colors refined. What you're seeing when you're looking at me is a refinement of seven colors. When you're looking at this wall up here, you're seeing a refinement of colors. And that's, you're seeing these sevens being refined so any image you see is colors. And remember the common word color in the Old Testament is the word ayin. means an eye. The reason the eye, you have the eye, is to refine colors so you can see shapes. And when we see Christ, we see the colors of Christ. I like to quote Romans 8 and 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate that he would be conformed to the colors, the image of Christ. Now, we'll get back into some colors later on. I just, I'm trying to get back to the subject where I am. Now, I hope you can see that. 370 days in an ark is a ordeal, fiery trial. And they were inside the baptism plus the yellow equals gold. Orange is just gold. Next time you go to the produce 
in the grocery store say, I need some gold. And they won't know what you're talking about, will they? That's what we buy when we buy oranges. There's no word in the English language that rhymes with orange. Unless it's that old commercial, orange, you glad you used dial? Remember that? <laughs> That's funny. Now, all right. Now, let's go back. We're in Ezekiel, the first chapter. I'm going to have to review, so I'm going to have to show you something where Ezekiel is. How I got into prophecy, you'll have to excuse me while I, I can't hardly teach Old Testament without getting into prophecy. I love prophecy. I love the history of Israel. I want to show you where Ezekiel is. I've said this, but let me give you some practical words on this, something you can perhaps see. I want you to turn over to uh, uh, 2 Kings, the 24th chapter. I'm going to try to set up Ezekiel. Then I'm going to go into, I'm going to work my way through the 10th, 11th chapter of Ezekiel. Then I'm going to go back to Exodus. This, what I'm doing here is showing you how this network works. It just, you teach on one thing, it takes you to a hundred different places, you know, thousands of places. See, I believe every word of the Bible is connected with every other word. I believe that God has sovereignly, mathematically ordained everything to synthesize with one another. But I've got to show you practically where Ezekiel is. Go over here to 2 Kings. Sometimes it takes a long time to go, well, not sometimes, all the time it takes a long time to go through these things. Now, I'm always pointing to this chart over here, these kings of Israel. You can't see them from there. Well, I need a great big chart of the kings. I need a great big huge stage with great big chalkboards and all kinds of maps on them. These are the kings of Israel, right here. Israel's a nation from first king Saul under kings to the last king Zedekiah. And all the time they went after Baal and the grove and Shemosh and Molech, all these sun and tree gods, which later on was brought into the church by Constantine when he amalgamated Christianity and paganism, brought in the feast of Saturn out of Rome, December the 17th through the 24th, brought it into the church where they threw the Yule log in the fire, celebrated the birthday of the unconquerable son on December the 25th. Mithra was his name over in Rome. Brought that into church and renamed it Christ's Mass. Same system Israel's going after in the Old Testament. And because they went after all these gods for 500 years, 500 years, God says, I'm going to send the sword, the famine, the pestilence over and over for 500 years. Finally, I'll send the beast. The beast was Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. It was called the beast because Babylon was represented as the lion. Persia was represented as the bear. Greece is the leopard. And Rome was the beast with iron teeth. It subdued all these others. Now, what we're talking about is is Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel lived, if you'll notice on this chart up here, he lived right here at the end of Israel's history. Here's Saul, David, Solomon. They are the righteous kings. Well, Solomon, not, excuse me, not righteous kings. They're in the United Kingdom. Saul wanted, he was jealous of David and tried to kill him said David's trying to steal his throne, then Solomon turned away after his wife's gods. God splits the kingdom into northern Israel, southern Judah. Northern Israel apostates against God, goes after all this Baal in the grove because of Ahab marrying Jezebel, bringing Baal in the grove and all these gods down into Israel. Bleeds down into southern Judah when Ahab and Jezebel's daughter Athaliah marries Jehoshaphat. I'm Excuse me, not Jehoshaphat, Jehoram. And then, and then uh, this kingdom continues. She brings her gods down. Southern Judah gets apostate. 
And we get down here to the last righteous king, Josiah. Josiah is the last righteous king in Israel. His father is Ammon. Well, let me put it a little lower. Josiah. Now, this is the time period of Ezekiel. His father's Ammon. Ammon's father was Manasseh. And Manasseh's father was Hezekiah. <coughs> Hezekiah was the most righteous king that ever lived in Israel that walked to God according to faith. Josiah, his great-grandson, was the most righteous king in Israel that walked according to the commandment of God and kept all the law of God more than any other king. Josiah's father was e evil. Josiah's grandfather, Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, was the most evil king ever in Israel. And I thought the first time I read about him, I thought God needs to kill him and put him in hell until I read Second Chronicles and he believed God when he was carried away to Babylon. <coughs> it just shows you how evil a Christian can be when you look at Manasseh there in the 21st chapter, 1 Kings 21. And what we're doing, <coughs> we're getting down to the end of Israel's history down here with Ezekiel. <coughs> We've told you that there were three deportations. To deport something means to remove them forcibly. This is what happened to Israel. God sent Nebuchadnezzar in. This is the beast coming in to remove Israel forcibly. When you import something, you bring it in legally into the country. When you export it, you, you uh, ship it out legally. When you deport, when they would deport Lucky Luciano because of all of his criminal activities, they would kick him out of the country. Israel was deported. They were kicked out by God out of Israel because they never kept the sabbatical years. And they were taken over here. Ezekiel was in the second deportation. You're going to find those deportations... In 2 Kings, I'm going to show them to you. 2 Kings, the 24th chapter. You're going to find these deportations. One was in 605 B.C. One was in 597 B.C. Now, it is commonly believed this is the deportation these were more or less peaceful deportations, but they were done by force by the Babylonian king because Israel was rebellious against Babylon as well as God. And then you had the final demise and destruction of southern Judah, which is southern Israel, in 586 B.C. I'm going to give you some approximate dates on these guys. Ezekiel was believed to be deported from Israel, taken from Israel, over to Babylon in the second deportation. Not exactly peaceful by force, but Israel wasn't fighting the battle up to that time. They began to try to war against, against Babylon in this 586. That's the total destruction when the chariots... The chariots came in of the Babylonians, those wheels and wheels, the ones that were prophesied by Ezekiel somewhere around 597, 96. And this was during the time period of the ends of the king of, kings of Israel. Now, I want us to look here in the 20. I'm going to try to outline this for you because I want you to see where Ezekiel was and what he was doing. He was prophesying the complete destruction. He was over here in Babylon. He had been carried away. He said he was on the river, banks of the river Kibar there in those first couple of verses of Ezekiel, the first chapter. Jeremiah was over here in Israel. Keep these 
prophets where they belong. You can't mix them up. Ezekiel is over here in Babylon. Daniel is carried away into Babylon. Jeremiah is over here in Israel. Haggai and Zechariah, when they get the message from God to stir up the people to finish building the temple, the temple is over here in Jerusalem. So Haggai and Zechariah over here in Israel. So you got to keep the guys where they belong. Now, the last righteous king, he begins reigning when he's eight years old in the 22nd chapter of Second Kings. That's Josiah. Somewhere around 641. 641 B.C. In that neighborhood. Of course, Israel's going to go down in 586. That's some years later. And it's believed that during the reign of Josiah, men like Zephaniah, Habakkuk, were prophesying. Habakkuk was said to be prophesying all the way back here to Manasseh. When the Lord, when Manasseh does all this wickedness by passing his children through the fire and raising up an Ashtaroth in the temple of God, doing more wickedness than all the kings before him, God passes a judgment over Israel and says, I'm going to wipe Jerusalem clean as a man wipes a slate, turning it upside down so that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. Boy, that's a, that is a pronouncement. And when he does that, it's believed that it was perhaps Habakkuk who had given that, that prophecy in the 21st chapter of 2 Kings. And then after that, Ammon rises up. He don't get much time in that 21st chapter of 2 Kings. He dies pretty quick. And then his son Josiah rises up. And Josiah's eight years old when he begins to reign. He gets the book of the law. He hears, he's, the book of the law is found in the ruins of the temple. Why would the temple be ruined at this point? Because his father was evil. His grandfather was evil. And they had literally destroyed the temple. Hezekiah had been righteous. But in two generations, they had just made no memory of the law of God. Well, the, the uh, Shaphan and the scribe found the book of the law in the temple. Well, why didn't they know it was there? They were out there serving sun gods. Nobody was going to the temple. It was in ruins. It needed repairs after two generations. Here it is. Fifty years later, it needs repairs. You leave a house untended for 25 or 30 years, it needs repairs, doesn't it? Well, they begin to go through the temple, and the scribe, Shaphan the scribe, found the book of the law, came in and Hilkiah, he gave it to Hilkiah the priest and they brought it to Josiah, read the book of the law and Josiah began to weep. And he said, we're going to have a revival. And he starts his revival in the 23rd chapter and he brings, he destroys all idolatry in Israel. The greatest revival Israel ever had destroyed everything in Israel. We're winding up the kingdom of God but God has already promised because of the wicked Manasseh he said, I'm going to destroy this city. I'm going to destroy Judah. I've already destroyed northern Israel in 722 B.C. Actually, over a 10-year period, from 732 to 722, there were three Assyrian kings, Tilgath-Pelnezer, or Tiglath-Pelnezer, and uh, Sargon, and Sennacherib. And for 10 years, they were attacking nor uh, southern Judah, and finally, they carried them away into captivity in 722 B.C. Over a 10-year period, they were just constantly laying siege to them. Southern Judah? Huh? Southern Judah? Or Northern, Southern Judah. Judah. Northern Israel has already been destroyed in uh, over 150, around 150 years before. But you call it Southern Israel or Judah. Now, I want to show you how this thing winds up so I can show you where... You're coming to the end of Israel's history. And the way you come to it, you go to, God says, I'm going to destroy southern Judah, but I'm not going to do it in the days of Josiah. And I want us to read what happens to, I'm setting this up so you can see where Ezekiel is in his prophecies. 
Ezekiel is Ezekiel is a contemporary of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's prophesying. Jeremiah prophesies for 40 years. He starts around 625 B.C. 625, 626. Prophesies to 586 B.C. That's 40 years. So he's in here all during the time of these last kings of Israel in here. From, from the end of Josiah's reign all the way down. And I want to show you this. So you can see where Ezekiel is. All right. Now, Josiah, let's read here. <clears throat> God says, I will not destroy all this in Josiah's day. Let's read here in verse 25 after Josiah's great revival. Verse 25 of chapter 23. And like unto Josiah, was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after Josiah arose there any like Josiah, turning to God, to the law. There was something similar said of Hezekiah back here. <coughs> Excuse me. Back here in the 18th chapter, in the 18th chapter, 2 Kings, this is his great grandfather. And here was said, here, this shows you what happened in two generations. The law totally forgotten because Hezekiah was truly the great, wonderful, righteous king of God. And so was his great grandson, Josiah. And here in verse 5 of chapter 18 of 2 Kings, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like unto him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. He, his, his accolades was in trust. Josiah's was in obedience to the law of God and turning to, the, and turning to God having been away from God. No one had ever turned to God like Josiah. <laughs> Hezekiah didn't. Hezekiah didn't have to turn to God because he always believed God. So Josiah's turning was the most magnificent that had ever been. What if I said Josiah's repentance was the greatest act of repentance of all the kings of Israel? Now go back over to the 23rd chapter. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? Now wait a minute, I've got to back up. Verse 26, notwithstanding, however, just because he was the most righteous king that turned to the Lord, the Lord <coughs> from the fierceness of the great wrath, wherewith God's anger was kindled against Judah or southern Israel <coughs> because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked withal, the Lord said, I'm not turning away from the promise to destroy northern Israel because of Manasseh's wickedness. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel or northern Israel, and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which is in southern Judah, the capital city, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. <laughs> now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? of the kings of Judah, and in its days. So we're headed towards demise of southern Judah and the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy that we see those chariots coming in to Jerusalem in the first chapter of Ezekiel. Pharaoh Necho, who was king of Egypt at that time, or Pharaoh of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him and he slew him, this is where Josiah dies, at Megiddo when he had seen him. And his servants carried Josiah in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah. 
Jehoahaz. Son of Josiah. Now, from this point on, Josiah is the last full righteous king of Israel. Everybody after this are going to be puppet kings. They're either going to be they're going to be under tribute to to Egypt or Babylon. They will be just a province from here on. The last legitimate king of Israel is Josiah. His sons and one grandson will be simply bowing to these monarchs of Egypt and Babylon. He took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king. Who made him king? the king that conquered them. He didn't make himself king, made him king in his father's stead. Jehoahaz was 20 and 3 years old. When he began to reign, he reigned three months in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, and the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. This is another Jeremiah. Jeremiah of Libna is not Jeremiah the prophet. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, so he does evil. This is Josiah's son, evil. According to all that his fathers had done, and Pharaoh Necho, who is the Pharaoh of Egypt, put him in bands at Riblah, so he puts him under subjection to the Egyptian kingdom. He makes them a vassalite kingdom of Egypt. They're just simply a, a province of Egypt. When you see a king make someone subject to their kingdom, put them in tribute. Tribute money is like tax money, or you would call it toll money. You have the privilege of living in my kingdom. You can rule yourself as long as you behave yourself. But when we quit behaving yourself, I'll come in and destroy you. You pay me tribute every year the way I stipulate if you don't. You'll die. So he puts him in tribute. Pharaoh Necho put him in bands at Riblah in Hamath that he might not reign in Jerusalem and put the land under tribute. That means the boss of Jerusalem here, right here, is Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. Not Babylon yet, but they will be. And put the land to tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, this is the brother, brother to Jehoahaz, makes him king. I thought he made Jehoiakim king. Well, he did. Made Eliakim king in, as king in the room of Josiah, his father not in the room of Jehoahaz, but made him king instead of his father because Jehoahaz has been carried away to Egypt and turned his name to Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. So Eliakim is actually Jehoiakim. So there he is right there. Jehoahaz, then Jehoiakim. Right down there. And he came to Egypt and died there. So, so Jehoahaz dies in Egypt, and Jehoiakim, K-I-M, gave silver and gold to Pharaoh, and he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. All this is saying is they're under the rule of Pharaoh in Egypt. That's what it's saying. And they have to do what the Pharaoh says. Here's Egypt over here. Here's Egypt down here. Here's Israel. They're subject to Pharaoh, but they're going to be put in subjection to the Babylonian kingdom who in around 612 B.C. conquers the Assyrian Empire and becomes the ruler of the civilized world. And Egypt just backs away and goes, ooh, 
this great lion is loose out here called Babylon. And they have to back off. And Babylon puts everyone under tribute. Tribute is says, I'm going to tax you and you pay. That's all it means. Now, and that means I am your boss. That's why Josiah was the last independent king of Israel. All these other guys are going to be subject to Egypt, Babylon. Now, according to the commandment of Pharaoh, he exacted the silver and gold of the people of the land. Sounds kind of boring when you just read it if you don't know what's going on. Of every one, according to the taxation given it unto Pharaoh Necho, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign. That's, that's the son of Josiah. Jehoahaz was Josiah's son. Eliakim, or Jehoiakim, was Josiah's son. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zabuda, the daughter of Padia of Ruma. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. <coughs> According to all that his, notice what it says, fathers had done, not according to what his father had done, because his father was Josiah, according to what his father's. Here's his father's right here. Father's meant anyone before him that was in his line. So he does according to Ammon, Manasseh, Jotham, Amaziah, Joash, Athaliah, Ahaziah, Jehoram, Rehoboam, Solomon. That's his fathers. He did evil like they did. Not his father, Josiah. That's why it says plural. Fathers had done. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene. King of Babylon came up and he assumes the power of the world at this point. And Egypt better back away because they don't have the power of Babylon. And in this chapter, you find the three deportations right here. Chapter 24. This is where the three deportations come. Babylon is, overthrows the Assyrian Empire around 612. Then the first, and here's what causes the deportations. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and Jehoiakim, right here, Jehoiakim, whose actual name was Eliakim, after Jehoahaz was carried away to Egypt, died there. That was his brother. Could have been his half-brother by another wife, because they had bunches of wives. Jehoiakim <coughs> became his servant three years. Then Jehoiakim rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Why do you think Nebuchadnezzar came down and attacked Israel? God put it in his mind because Israel was rebelling against him. Not only God, but they rebelled against what God placed over them. <coughs> and Jeremiah's preaching at this time. And he's telling them at this time, all through the book of Jeremiah, do not go down to Egypt and seek safety. Go to Babylon. I've got you over there for 70 years. If you don't go, and you go back to this Pharaoh Necho or any of his descendants, I'll have a Babylonian soldier chase you down and kill you. Don't do it. And the Lord sent against Jehoiakim. Here's the first this is approximately 605. Josiah dies somewhere around 609 B.C. Around 609. So, Jehoahaz reigns just a little while after that, and then Jehoiakim reigns a little after that, about three years. So you're just about four years down the road, at 605, and that's the first deportation, first deporting of Israel. The first, this is the first deportation right here. The Lord sent against Jehoiakim bands of Chaldees, which are Babylonians, and they're leading armies with them to go against Israel. 
or southern Judah, and bands of Syrians, and bands of Moabites, and bands of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy Judah. Of course, it doesn't take much. They go in there, and they start carrying these people away into Babylon. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. This is all because God said he's going to do it. He's put in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar to go in there and do that. So this is around 605. Surely at the command of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh. In that 21st chapter, I put double red lines under for the sins of Manasseh. Reminds us of that 26th verse of the 23rd chapter because of what Manasseh did. Notwithstanding, I'm not going to withdraw my judgment, even though Josiah was righteous. I've already promised I was going to destroy Judah. <clears throat> then he goes on. And bands of the Ammonites and sent them against Judah destroyed according to the word of the Lord, which he had spake by the prophets, all because of the sins of Manasseh in verse 3. And also for the innocent blood that he shed, that Manasseh shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood there in the 21st chapter of 2 Kings. You can read that, and I'm not going to go through that. Which the Lord would not pardon. God said, it doesn't matter what Josiah did. His great-grandfather was the most wicked king. I'm going to do what I promised. I'm going to empty Jerusalem. And he, when he empties them, he's pointing to the 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles. And he's pointing to the next chapter in this book, the 25th chapter. The 25th chapter <coughs> of 2 <Second> Kings <coughs> is equal to the <coughs> Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter. Same incident. <coughs> also in the book of Jeremiah, the 42nd chapter. This is where Nebuchadnezzar comes in and destroys him. It's Jeremiah's account. It's Second Kings' account. It's Second Chronicles' account. And that's the destruction that Ezekiel is prophesying. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? of the kings of Judah. So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers. That meant they took him to a tomb, put him on a little shelf bed inside a tomb by his fathers. It don't mean he slept somewhere in a, in a spirit sleep. It don't mean he went to heaven. It meant they took his body and put him on a shelf in a tomb with the rest of the kings that were there. And Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim... C-H-I-N. I'm always spelling it wrong. Y'all forgive me. Jehoiakim. C-H-I-N. I usually spell Kim with a C-H, but it's Jehoiakim is with a K. Jehoiakim is with a C-H. It has an N on the end of it instead of an M. Now, this is Jehoiakim is Jehoiakim's son. So Jehoiakim is Josiah's grandson. These two are brothers, right? Jehoiakim is Josiah's grandson. And I got something else to say about him. And reigned in his stead. And the king of Egypt came not again anymore out of his land because Babylon was in control. The king of Egypt went, I better stay over here and mind my business. That is the most powerful army on the face of the earth. And he went over there and minded his business. He dare not. At one time, under Pharaoh, in the 14th chapter of Exodus, when Pharaoh's armies were drowned, that, at Egypt at that time was the most powerful army in the world. At this point, Babylon is. <coughs> now, the king of Egypt came not again any more out of the land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates. He was the boss now. So Nebuchadnezzar is ruling from the great river of Egypt 
all the way up here. He's running the world. Pharaoh Nico says, I think I'll go home and sit down and behave myself. That's why Jeremiah keeps saying, don't go to Egypt. They cannot protect you. For the king of Babylon has taken from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates all that pertain to the king of Egypt. He rules Egypt now. <coughs> so you better behave, Israel. You got the most powerful, regal, lion kingdom that has ever been on the earth. And Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nahushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father had done. Not fathers. His father was Jehoiakim. It said that Eliakim or Jehoiakim did the evil of his fathers. Not talking about Josiah because his father wasn't evil. So notice the difference between singular and plural. Can you see that? You have to pay attention. You can't change plurality to singularity. You can't do that in the Bible. If you do, you change the word of God. Now, at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. Here's the second deportation. Right here. Spockley 597. And as Jehoiakim is carried away, so is Ezekiel. He's the one that goes in this captivity. And he's by the river Kibar in the first chapter of Ezekiel, isn't he? He's headed out with him. And at the time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. You can put second deportation there, and you can put first deportation by verse two. By verse two. <coughs> Both of them were by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. They were more or less peaceful. <coughs> now, <coughs> there was probably some rough things going on, some people getting beat up, knocked down in the streets drug out of their houses. But it wasn't an all-out war like it was in 586. And Ezekiel is prophesying 586. He's going out in this deportation, it is believed, right here. All of his prophecies from Ezekiel, the first chapter through the tenth chapter, is talking about, and all those wheels and wheels are talking about the war chariots coming in, in 586. That was a total annihilation, Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar comes in, burns the city down, pulls everything down. They didn't have, don't think of Jerusalem as all these beautiful pictures of stalwart buildings with great pillars and all of this that you see in some movie. Uh, the writers will tell you that these buildings that they built, most of them didn't have foundations. They stood up on sticks. The temple was built properly, but the people didn't. They had a good wall around Jerusalem, but they had all kinds of stick houses. When he come in there, he pulled down the walls of Jerusalem, burnt the walls, burnt the city, pulled down all the, all the, the uh, huge stones of the temple, leveled it, carried everything away, all the vessels of the house of the Lord. Then he came in and he plowed up the city, poured salt through it, and it looked like a wasteland. And Israel is over there marching towards towards Babylon. And only the poor were left in Israel. And Jeremiah was given the choice by Nebuchadnezzar, by his commanding general, Nebuchadnezzar, and say, if we heard you're an honorable man. You kept trying to warn these people. They rebelled against me. They rebelled against their God. Jeremiah, you are honorable. We'll take you to Babylon. You can have land. We'll raise you up. Whatever you want. He said, I'll stay here with the poor. Jeremiah stayed there. We don't have any record of what happened to him. He did not take the daughters of Zedekiah and go to England and establish the throne of England. That's not true. The throne was never established through daughters. Never. It was established through one of the sons of Judah. 
And I've gone through that, that 38th chapter of, of Genesis where Tamar seduced Judah because she, he wouldn't give her the surviving third son that he had to keep the lineage of Judah going, so she had to seduce him and pretend to be a prostitute. He said, whoever did this, he said, she became pregnant. He said, she, this woman's going to die. And she said, Who's, who, who did this to you, made you pregnant? And she held out his bracelet and stabbed and said, the man that gave me these. He went, oh, oh me, that was me. He said, you're more honorable than I am. And she kept the lineage going because it had to come from a man. How much time do I have? Oh, man, I ain't even going to get through this. I'm just showing you where Ezekiel is. The throne wasn't established through daughters of Zedekiah or sons of Zedekiah. Guess what? The throne of God was established through Jehoiakim. Not Zedekiah, the last king. Let's read on. Verse 12, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon in the second deportation. In that deportation, Ezekiel was with him. Probably could have been walking right along beside Jehoiakim as they were carried away 650 miles away to Babylon. And he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign and carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. This is in the second deportation. And cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord. And the Lord had said, as the Lord had said, and carried away all of Jerusalem, all the princes, all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives. It doesn't mean only 10,000 were carried away. It means 10,000 mighty men, 10,000 people who were craftsmen and smiths that could make weapons against the king. So in the second deportation, any strength of Israel was removed. Now I'll go into, and all that was left in the land, and none remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. Boy, that's the remnant, isn't it? The poor, the brokenhearted, the bruised. And when we get back to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, there's a, it's figurative language. It's allegorical, but there's a man that's appointed with an ink pen to go around and mark those at the destruction of Judah with a mark of God in their foreheads and in their hands that these are the ones that God's going to spare. And I believe it's these poor right here that Jeremiah stays with. Because after the destruction of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar comes in and says, Jeremiah, you can go with us. He says, I'll stay here with the poor. That's amazing to me. And that's a picture in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel <coughs> of these four beasts, of these four angels of the four beasts. In Revelation, the seventh chapter, sealing the servants of God in their foreheads. The same picture. And I meant to get to that tonight, and I'm not going to. <coughs> Look here. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon and the king's mother <coughs> and the wives, his officers, and the mighty of the land. And they carried him into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might were 7,000 craftsmen, smiths, that's men that work in metal. <coughs> the reason for this is let's weaken Israel so they can't even fight us or make weapons when we come in, when we have to come back. This is the second deportation. They make them so weak 
And what's amazing is Zedekiah rebels after this and he has nothing to fight with. That's astounding to me. <coughs> Craftsman and Smith <coughs> and Smith's a thousand. <coughs> but you got to remember there was a great slaughter in Israel. Perhaps a million lying dead out there that were rebelling when the final demise came. And all the men of might, 7,000 craftsmen and smiths and thousand and all that were strong and apt for war, even them, the king of Babylon, brought captive to Babylon. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, his father's brother, His father's brother, which was another son of Josiah, wasn't it? King in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, Zedekiah is king at the final destruction of Jerusalem, isn't he? So let's put his name down, Mataniah, M-A-T-T-A-N-I-A-H, M-A-T-T-A-N-I-A-H. Mataniah is Zedekiah. And Zedekiah is king at the final destruction, isn't he? Now, let me just show it, point out something to you. These people that preach Anglo-Israelism, they say that, that Jeremiah took Zedekiah's daughters to England and, and established the throne of God in England. That's ridiculous. The throne wasn't established through Zedekiah. The only way it can be established is through sons. In the next chapter is the total destruction of southern Judah. Chapter 24 is the, ends with the second deportation. Chapter 25 is the third deportation or the total destruction of Jerusalem. And in that 25th chapter, they bring Zedekiah's sons before him. Nebuchadnezzar brings his sons before him and says, Look at your sons. This is the last time you'll see them. Kills his sons before his very eyes. Zedekiah is rebellious, been rebellious. How can you rebel when you got nothing to fight with? Stupid. Hang Jeremiah in the mire. And punch his eyes out. He has nothing to succeed him in the kingdom. Nothing. No sons. Jeremiah didn't take his daughters and establish the throne of God in England. The throne was established through Jehoiakim, a contraction for Jehoiakim is Jeconias. And you find Jeconias in Matthew, the first chapter, in the lineage of Jesus. He is an ancestor in the lineage of Jesus. The throne was established through Jehoiakim, not Mataniah or Jedekiah. I don't know why these people that preach Anglo-Israelism don't look at the details of their scripture. Look over there in the last chapter of Jeremiah. They've imagined an imagination. Jeremiah, last chapter. This is Jeremiah's account of Mr. Jeconias or Jehoiakim, a contraction is a short for a word like cannot. Cannot, a contraction is can't. D-O-N-T, don't, that's a contraction. Jeconias is a contraction for Jehorkin. And here in the last chapter, uh, Jeremiah, after all is done, all is destroyed, verse 31, last chapter, Verse 50, chapter 52, it came to pass in the 7th and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Not Zedekiah, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, in the 12th month, in the 5th and 20th day of the month, that Evel Merodach, king of Babylon, who came after Nebuchadnezzar, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him forth out of the prison 
and spake kindly to Jehoiakim unto him and set his throne above the thrones of the kings that were with him in Babylon and, char and changed his prison garments. He did continually eat bread with the king of Babylon all the days of his life. And for his diet, there was a continual diet given him of the king of Babylon every day, a portion until the day of his death, all the days of his life. And when you go to Matthew, the first chapter, Matthew, the first chapter, I don't know where in the world these guys think the throne of God was established in England under the, under the throne of Ephraim. That's ignorance. The throne doesn't come out of Ephraim. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Zedekiah was, a, was, a, was from Judah, but so was Jehoiakim. And when you go over here and look at Matthew, the first chapter, Anglo-Israelism is crazy. You go over here and you see the lineage of Jesus. You see book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, and uh, Isaac, Jacob, and then Judas and Tamar there in verse 3. This is the lineage of Jesus. Amram, Amram begat Abinadab, begat Naasan, Naasan begat Solomon, Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab, Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, Obed begat Jesse, Jesse begat David the king, David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah, Solomon begat Rehoboam, Rehoboam begat Abiah, that's this lineage right here. These are kings of Judah, one son after the other. Asa begat Jehoshaphat in verse 8. Jehoshaphat begat Joram. Jehoram begat Hosias. Hosiah begat Jotham. Jotham begat Achaz. Achaz begat Hezekiah. Hezekiah begat Manasseh. Manasseh begat Ammon. Ammon begat Josiah. Je Josiah begat Jeconias. Contraction for Jehoiakim. The lineage of God goes back to Jehoiakim, not Zedekiah. And that's the truth. Anglo-Israelism is just a lie. I know Herbert W. Armstrong taught that, and so, does, so did that wacky guy out of Arkansas. What's his name? Uh, Murray. And they come up and say that Jeremiah took Zedekiah's daughters. You don't establish the kingdom through daughters. It went through sons. And the Bible says it went through Jeconias, Jehoiakim. Now, how did they miss that? What really amazes me is they'll say, well, Jeremiah took the daughters of Zedekiah, went to England, took the stone in the wilderness. First of all, the stone where water came out of there were two and a half million people. It had to be the size of a river. Could be something a wing could set on. That ain't going to give enough water to all the people in Nashville every day, is it? And that's half of what went into the wilderness. And then they say, England became Ephraim. And America became, America became Manasseh. And that's the true Jew is Ephraim and Manasseh. That's ridiculous. The throne isn't established through Ephraim. Ephraim had the inheritance through Joseph, but he didn't have the throne. Judah had the throne. The scepter will not depart from Judah. And Judah, that's Jehoiakim down to Jesus. It's ridiculous. And they said the reason England was Ephraim because that was the strongest of the tribes when Anglo-Israelism started in the mid-1800s. And Manasseh was the weaker of the tribes. But since the USA is the stronger than England now, does that make us Ephraim and then Manasseh? Huh? Is that crazy? Makes no sense. Whew. We've got a bunch of people here that's been in that, but it's just not right. And I wanted to paint this picture for you to show you where Ezekiel is He's in the same captivity that Jehoiakim was in. He's carried away about the same time. And Ezekiel, in that captivity, is on the river Kibar in Ezekiel, the first chapter, and he's prophesying the total destruction 
of Jerusalem, and that happens in the ninth and the tenth chapter of Ezekiel. And how I got there from the seven candlesticks, I don't know. I hope you can. You see that, huh? It's a lot. But if you can look at that twenty-fourth chapter, you'll see those deportations, and the throne is established through Jeh- through Jehoiakim, and Jeconias is a contraction for Jehoiakim, not Zedekiah. Zedekiah was lost in the wind. He was the biggest pansy king. I can't imagine. After they carry away in that second deportation, all the artificers of metal and the guys that can, all the princes, no leaders, and Zedekiah sitting over there with a bunch of poor people rebelling against the king. He must have been nuts. You know it? Even Pharaoh Necho was afraid of Babylon. This moron on the throne of England wasn't afraid of the king of Babylon. He was crazy. Maybe he's mentally ill or something. You've got to be out of your mind to go. That's kind of like some little five-year-old saying, I'm not afraid of that six-foot-ten giant. Well, you better be, kid. Too much inbreeding. Yeah, that's probably it. Maybe he said a guy had too much inbreeding. He was marrying his cousins, and they were marrying their cousins or something. Maybe they're all from Alabama or something. <laughs> That's the end of this message. I ha- I'm just really not through with it. I really wanted to take you to Jeremiah and show you when Jeremiah was told you can come to Babylon. He said, I'll just stay here with the poor. Jeremiah, when he stayed there, boy, what he turned down was all... It reminds me of Moses. Moses refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He chose the affliction with the people of God. And Jeremiah said, I'll stay here with the poor. There was no Jerusalem, no temple, no law, nothing. He said, I'll stay here in this wasteland. That's why they didn't want to come back when they got the first decrees in 538 to go back and rebuild the temple. There's nothing there. Who wants to go back over? When God tells you to come out of Babylon and rebuild this temple of God, boy, that's a hard job starting on it, isn't it? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Help us to understand this book. Lord, I'm trying as hard as I can, Lord. I pray for the people at Grace and Truth and for all your elect, Lord. Open up the doors for the ministry. Cause us to understand your word. God, thank you for the vision, the insight to see these things. I pray for the church they can see them. Lead us to elect, and I pray for the flock that you'll mature them in the faith. God will praise you and glorify you for all things. Lead us to elect in Christ's name, amen.